The Beholder's Campaign, which I am referring to as Phallasophobia, takes place before Spear Masters. In order to unlock them, you must tune into the brown broadcast found in Spear Masters' Campaign. In Phallasophobia, you play as a new slug cat called the Beholder. They are an aquatic-like slug cat akin to Rivulet, except that the Beholder is exclusively aquatic and can't breathe outside of water. This means that Phallasophobia takes place primarily in the ocean, in a completely different location from all the other slug cats, with its own gloomy regions and nightmarish creatures. But before we talk about that, let's first take a look at how the Beholder plays. So let's talk swimming. The Beholder's swim speed is higher than Rivulet's at around a 2. You're able to control your movement more tightly than with other slug cats when underwater. And the difference between swimming with and without boosting is a lot smaller as well. Because your body is more adapted to living underwater, buoyancy is also significantly reduced. If you get tired of swimming and want some more precision, you can hold grab near a wall in order to extend two flimsy legs that stick to surfaces. This allows you to effectively walk underwater, not only on the floor, but also on walls and ceilings. Your walk speed is a bit slower than you swimming and you won't be able to pull off some of the stuff you would normally be able to like rolling and sliding. Jumping off of surfaces when walking on them will also give you a good amount of momentum. Because of the fact that you are constantly underwater, spears aren't as reliable for combat as usual. But you won't be needing those. You are able to hold the jump button in order to charge into creatures and paling them. The longer you charge your attack for, the faster you get, dealing more damage on impact at the cost of getting temporarily stuck to surfaces in case you miss, with the lowest speed dealing 1.25 damage and max being free. You can only cancel a charge during its initial preparation, once it starts you can't stop it. When you hit a creature, you will begin to slowly drain foot pips from them. This process also deals a small amount of damage over time. Remember that if you dealt a small amount of damage to a hostile creature and it doesn't immediately die, they might be able to bite you still, so be careful. This isn't your only method of eating though, you can still eat small things just like normal as you are omnivorous. You can also use your charge for quick movement in straight passageways, ideally with minimal obstacles. As previously stated, you are unable to breathe outside of water. It'll take around 10 seconds for you to completely run out of breath and die. When outside of water, the Beholder also moves a little differently than you may expect. You begin with a speed of 2, but over those 10 seconds, your speed will slowly decrease as we reach 0 and you die. Your jump is also really bad, but if you have enough speed, you can clear pretty big gaps regardless. Additionally, you will be able to climb up walls for a few seconds before falling down in order to climb small ledges. You obviously can't walk on ceilings and down walls like you would normally be able to underwater. Now that I have talked about the Beholder's more basic abilities, let's dive into the more complex ability the Beholder has. So you probably noticed that one of the Beholder's eyes looks different than the other, with the right one looking particularly weird. 
That is because it is actually a highly modified overseer eye that was implanted into their eye socket. You can press the S button in order to activate a scan. It will display things that a typical overseer normally would. However, there's a catch. You can't select exactly what it will show, but it's not completely random, otherwise it would be a bit pointless. It chooses what to show you based on a list of priorities. I will go over this list explaining each entry and why it's placed there from most to least prioritized. On top of the list, overriding all other things is the breath timer. As soon as there's only 5 seconds left before running out of breath, your eye will automatically turn on and show you a countdown from 5 to 0. This is on here on the list because it's guaranteed to kill you when it goes down, unlike the next ones. In second place is Food Hazard. Okay, so let me explain this. In Thalassophobia, there are certain foods that can be dangerous to consume that are indistinguishable from their non-hazardous counterparts. This applies under the condition that the food hazard is either within arm's reach or already in your hands. This is so high up because at that point, you're only one button away from death. Next is if a hostile creature is close to you. Let's say about 10 grids of distance from you without any obstacles in the way. This is obviously something that will very likely result in death, explaining why it's such a high priority. I still put food hazard over this because some players try to eat while being chased. After that is a nearby shelter, but in the specific condition of only one fourth of the timer being left before the cycle ends. In this situation, the most appropriate course of action is to prioritize getting to a shelter safely as fast as possible. This one is particularly important as most regions in Phalasophobia do not have rain and have some other kind of environmental threat that does not have a timer. So if you see this, you better start looking for a shelter. Uh, following the last one is a hostile creature that is coming towards you in around a 20 tile radius, even through walls that is. This isn't an immediate threat, but it is something that you should be cautious about. The last danger related one is the closest hostile creature in the room. This one is really useful for detecting ambush predators, as a lot of them can be almost undetectable. This last placement can alternate depending on a few things. The first one is whether you have enough food to hibernate. In case you don't, then you will be shown where the nearest food can be found, not counting big creatures of course. If you do have enough to hibernate, it will alternate between two other options depending on how much time you have. If you have half of your cycle left, it will show you the nearest shelter. If you have more than half of your cycle left, it will indicate where you are supposed to go instead. Additionally, when you are in a dark room, regardless of activating it or not, your eye will light up dark spaces in front of you, similarly to how Iggy does when you play as Monk. But in this case, it reaches farther away, towards the direction you are facing, kinda like a flashlight. You will still be able to scan stuff normally while doing this. Just before this section ends, I want to quickly talk about food. Because you can so easily find food anywhere using your scan, you will have a 5 food requirement and no extra food bips. But to further incentivize the use of the needle attack, you're able to keep 5 additional food bips exclusively when using that attack. You could still survive without using it, but it will definitely help you a lot. You begin in a region named Looming Dunes. It's mostly empty with very little food around. 
you encounter two new creatures in this region, the first of them being the minnows. These are essentially a bat fly equivalent, they are usually seen surely. If you try to pursue them, they may try to divide themselves into groups and go in different directions and try to hide into some anemone, if given the chance. Speaking of, the second one is an ambush predator that looks identical to non-aggressive anemone. If you get close, they will get up, slowly swimming in your direction while extending their tentacles similar to worm grass. If you see a group of minnows avoid an anemone, you know it's one of the aggressive ones. Because you're so deep underwater in the seafloor, the rain doesn't actually reach down. So instead, when the cycle ends, nighttime will come and a colossal leviathan will chase you. They will always know where you are and will always chase you down alongside a bunch of tiny baby ones in case you try to escape into spaces that the big one can't reach. After barely escaping the glooming dunes, you manage to find a new region. This one is called Subaqueous Thicket. It is a region that is full of kelp. Not monster kelp though, just kelp. These might contain a fruit along their type. Each of them give you two food pips. However, you must be careful as some of the kelp are more sensitive than others and may notice you. If they do, all kelp in the room will turn aggressive and try to grab onto you. If successful, they will drag you into the ground in order to devour you. So you must use your scan to make sure it's safe. While navigating the inner parts of this region, trying to find a way out, you encounter a hammerhead lizard. Apart from their flattened heads, these aquatic lizards are very fast and have four tongues they can simultaneously launch out in order to catch prey, covering a 120 degree area, making them a pretty big threat. You head upwards towards the seafloor of this area, where you find even more kelp and another creature named poison lilies. As their name suggests, they are poisonous so you can't eat them. But sea lizards are prone to biting them instead of you, so you may want to carry one of them around just in case. In this top part of the region, the rain can kill you. But in the underground section, as soon as the cycle ends, all kelp will wake up and try to grab you even if you didn't touch them. You decide to head towards the left in the direction indicated by your eye, where you will find a gate to a new region. You eventually find yourself in the lower section of the gateway. This region takes place almost exclusively out of water with few spots where you can recover your breath. This is possible due to two things. Firstly, there is a constant soft rain in this region that allows you to stay out of the water for an extra 10 seconds. As well as an abundance of bubble fruit which will restore your breath. This initial part takes place in a dead zone containing a lot of dried out coral. This region contains one new creature, the Sea Geek. They swim a lot like frogs and give you a great supplement for your terrible jumps. You might come across some vultures and orange lizards on your way up. Once you manage to make it through, you will be greeted with the first ending.
this time around, you decide to explore a little more than in your last run. While replaying through this first region, you spot a hover ray. These creatures have a very rare chance of showing up. They swim around in a line as they migrate towards the deeper portions of the ocean. They might have some mold on their back which you can scoop up and eat. You also discover a secret area called the nest, where you find the colossal leviathan and its babies sleeping. If you go behind them, you will find a bunch of eggs which will fill up your food pips. In exploring the subaqueous thicket for the second time, you decide to disobey your eye and go right instead of left when in the seafloor of this region. On your way, you spot a few grey overseers stalking you through the layers of kelp surrounding you. You eventually come across a gate that leads you into a new region. You find yourself in the can of an idol raider that goes by the name of Great Wind, traveling through the piping system that helps cool down the superstructure. You eventually make your way out, as a lot of them seem to be damaged and leaking probably because of how old Chasing Wind is in comparison to the other Idle Raiders. This is good news for you since you can use these links to regain breath as you navigate through the rooms of this gigantic maze-like facility with the help of your sticky appendages. After a long time, you manage to make your way into the puppet chamber. From this point onwards, you will no longer be able to activate your eye on command, and it will only guide you towards the top of the gateway. It will also retain its ability to light up dark areas. 
After this, you make your way back to the top of the gateway, where you will be able to get your second ending. If you choose to continue, you will begin inside of Chasing Wind's Puppet Chamber, which is completely submerged in a special fluid that allows you to breathe and is also quite nutritious, filling up all of your food pips. Grey Wind made you a new eye and also gave you Karma 10, so you say your last goodbyes and you go on your journey to ascend. You follow the directions that are given by your brand new eye, which leads you to a sub-region of the Subaqueous Thicket to the far left of its cave system called... The Festering Burrow. This entire section is covered top to bottom with a pulsating fleshy tissue, infested with the smell of blood cursing through each and every room. No creatures spawn here, but you must still be cautious, as touching the flesh of this area will make it expand, filling up all the rooms, crushing all of your bones and organs into a fine pulp. You carefully make your way to the bottom of this area, where you find the heart of this monstrous cyst. You stab your needle into its heart, draining every last drop of fluid it may contain as it furiously beats in an agonizing pain until it dies. This will cause the entire sub-region to go dark and stop pulsating, as well as make all of the kelp die, leaving only their fruits behind. The heart is now torn apart, below it lies piles and piles of blank data pearls, leading up to a new region called the necropolis. The area is an abandoned city from before the ancients had discovered the Void Sea, completely submerged within the deepest and darkest depths of the ocean to be forever forgotten. Since then, many creatures have taken residence within the city, thriving within its dark environment only lit up by the glow berries. These have a 50-50 chance to be poisonous, so you must always check to see if they are edible or not. You may also want to watch out for the angler lizard, as they camouflage themselves in the dark, imitating the glowberries. If you get close to them, they will open a collection of frills around its body, which create a great impulse that allows them to quickly launch towards you in a similar fashion to the cyan lizard. After this, their frills will retreat in order to recharge as the angler lizard swarms towards you. In this dark and dead place, you encounter the stalker, a creature akin to the vultures, but instead of having wings, it has four big spiked legs it uses to creep around, as well as a giant neck that can extend up to the length of an entire room with a vision that surpasses that range. 
You manage to escape the necropolis and make your way into the Abyssal Sanctum. This subregion is composed of a long tunnel that extends all the way until the left side of the necropolis. This area is filled with the corpses of many creatures who were unfortunate enough to have found this place. Their body is now covered in a kind of mold colony that is able to send small impulses for the decomposing bodies, allowing them to take control and chase you. So you must be careful as to at any moment any of the corpses can momentarily try to kill you, and your scan is unable to warn you about which of them will come to life. In this entire region, whenever the cycle ends, all of these corpses will come out and try to hunt you down. After everything you went through, you finally reach the abyss itself, where you can finally rest easy and ascend. Thank <laughs> you. 